Welcome to Exploring the Gospels. In today's message, The Gospel of Matthew, Dr. McLuhan introduces us to King Jesus and his kingdom. After hearing biographies of Matthew, Mark, Dr. Luke, and John, as writers, we are ready to explore the Gospels that they wrote themselves. My purpose today is to help us discover the rich treasures that are found in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew has always occupied the first place in the New Testament. Matthew's gospel is the most natural continuation of the story of salvation that began in the book of Genesis. The thread of God's plan of salvation from humanity, from sin to salvation, runs through each of the books of the New Testament and finds its fulfillment in the gospels. The genealogy in chapter 1 identifies Jesus as Messiah, the one who descended from King David. Going even further back in Jesus' genealogy, we discover that he is the son of Abraham, and that means that he is the one who brings the blessing of God to all the nations of the world. Jesus fulfilled the ancient prophecies of Messiah when he was called Emmanuel, we hear that name a lot at Christmas. It means God with us. Jesus was God with us. He came to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Matthew's gospel has a clear beginning in chapters 1 through 3 and a clear ending in chapters 26 through 28. In between... Matthew divides his gospel into five primary teaching sections along with relevant stories and parables. After the genealogy of Jesus, we read about the incredible conception of Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary, the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, and the visit of the wise men. These events all fulfilled Old Testament prophecies by showing that Jesus, as Emmanuel, God with us, he became human. Matthew wants us to discover that Jesus was the one whom Moses wrote about when he said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a powerful prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him that you shall listen, Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15. Like Moses, Jesus came out of Egypt. Like Moses, Jesus passed through the Red Sea, or passed, as, as Moses passed through the Red Sea, so Jesus passed through the waters of baptism in the Jordan River. As Moses spent 40 years in the desert, Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness and defeated the devil. Jesus' first major teaching known as the Sermon on the Mount in Galilee. Moses brought the letter of the law that came down from the mount, but Jesus brought the spirit of the law from the Sermon on the Mount. Moses wrote five books of the law, and Jesus gave uh, five primary teachings that contrasted the spirit and the letter of the law. Quite often Jesus said, you heard it said, but I say to you, and he went on to explain the spirit of the law. Jesus perfectly fulfilled the law and became the new Torah teacher. In the first teaching section, chapters 4 through 7, Jesus arrived in Galilee announcing the dawn of the kingdom of heaven. It was his favorite expression. The kingdom of heaven is the biggest picture of what God is doing in the universe. It is God's plan to rescue people from the consequences of sin. This is why Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If it's not in heaven, it shouldn't be on earth. And our prayer is to bring down heaven to invade the problems of earth. So what is the kingdom of God? It is any place where Jesus is recognized as king and his will is obeyed. Today it is spiritual. 
But when Jesus returns to earth a second time, it will be physical. Jesus said his kingdom is growing silently within us. How many of you feel the kingdom of God growing within you? Yet Jesus intends for his uh, kingdom to be manifested publicly through our lives, the people that we encounter on a day-to-day basis. King Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to heal and he came to save. He came to form a band of followers who will spread his message to everyone everywhere. That's why we read in Matthew, you are the light of the world. What a great statement. A city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, and a few verses later, in the same way, you are the light. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. On that mount, he shared eight blessings to those who follow Jesus that those who follow Jesus will receive. In the second primary teaching section, chapters 8 through 10, Jesus gives us a living demonstration of what it means to follow Jesus and to be touched by Jesus. Matthew records stories of nine people who had powerful encounters with Jesus. People were healed and set free from demons. And it all began in Peter's mother-in-law's home. It's a beautiful thing when healing comes home. He healed people of incurable diseases like leprosy. He forgave sin. He healed a paralyzed man. He healed a centurion's son without even going under his roof. He stilled a violent storm. People were in awe of what they saw and what they experienced. Jesus never separated healing from salvation. Jesus came to heal and to save people from sin. And Jesus usually released the power of God to heal before he preached. Understanding this simple principle has radically changed my approach to ministry. He never asked religious questions. He prayed for people who didn't believe in him. He prayed for people from other religions. He simply loved and cared for people enough for them to be healthy. After that, their curiosity could lead them to a greater kingdom. Jesus ended this section with calling 12 apostles to follow him and gave them power and authority to do exactly what he did, a remarkable transfer of power. These 12 all did what Jesus did. I I marvel that Judas and Thomas both healed, both touched people, and both prayed for people. Many people accepted Jesus because of the miracles they saw But the religious leaders began to feel jealous about his popularity. In the third section, chapters 11 through 13, Matthew shares a collection of stories of how people responded to Jesus. And in this section, when he was asked a question, we see the parables. He usually responded to a question with a parable delightful parables that Jesus told. For example, he told the parable about the farmer who sowed seed on different types of soil. You remember rocky, hard, good, thorny, different kinds of soil. And The story is about the hearts and the reactions of people to what Jesus said. It has nothing to do with farming. The story lets us know that Jesus is an extravagant farmer. And what do I mean by that? Jesus drops seeds of opportunity every day into the lives of people, including those who are the most resistant to his message. And through this message, Jesus is dropping seeds of hope and life right now. This message I'm preaching, seeds of life and hope are being offered to people right now, to people who may have rejected him all of their lives. It could be that as you are listening, God is opening your mind to see Jesus in a different light. You're sure that he's a prophet. But today, if you're seeing him as more than a prophet, 
It means that the Spirit of God is talking to you. We encourage you to keep listening to this message. In the fourth section, chapters 14 through 20, Matthew tells us about the different expectations that people had about the Messiah. It became clear that many expected Messiah to be a political ruler rather than a suffering servant. Jesus continued to heal the sick. Twice he miraculously fed multitudes of people. Don't you love those feedings? (laughs) Jesus loved a good party. He did this for both Jews and Gentiles, which shows us and helps us to understand that he is willing to help anyone then and now. He's willing to help you today. He'll multiply the needs that you have. His meeting, his his feeding, his, his, his help will bring a multiplication of solutions to you. After feeding the 5,000, many people wanted to take him by force and make him their king. Others saw him as more than a prophet. It's at this point that the religious leaders are hardening their hearts even further against Jesus. They even go so far as to accuse him of blasphemy. That's a very serious accusation. Jesus withdrew at that moment and began teaching his disciples more and more about the mission that God gave him to do. And in chapter 16, Jesus asks his disciples what could be the most important question that anyone could be asked. Do you remember this question? Jesus came to the district of Philippi and he asked his disciples, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. What an important question this is. Who do you say the Son of Man is? Amazingly, Peter comes up with the right answer. He says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. What a remarkable response. Jesus said to him, only the Spirit of God could help you come to that conclusion. Now, often people say to me, it's not possible God can't have a son. How can God have a son? And I usually give them the same answer that Jesus gave to Peter. No one can understand how God can have a son with human thinking. The only way to arrive at that conclusion is for the Spirit of God to come upon you. Ask God, ask the Spirit of God to reveal to you the mystery of who Jesus is. He will show you if you will ask him sincerely. Jesus went on to teach the apostles from the book of Isaiah that the Messiah must suffer many things. He must die for the sins of the people, but he will come back again, not as a suffering servant, but as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus went on to give another teaching to the people about this upside-down kingdom. That's what we like to call it. Things aren't the way you think they should be. One gains honor by serving. And instead of taking revenge, we are to forgive and let God do what only God can do. In the last of the five sections of Matthew, chapters 21 through 25, we see the clash between these two kingdoms, the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of Jesus. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, proceeds to turn over the money changers in the court of the Gentiles. This makes the religious leaders furious, and it's really the last straw. They make the final decision that they are going to have this man killed, whatever it takes. So in response, Jesus gives his final teaching on another mount, the Mount of Olives, And we know this teaching as the Olivet Discourse. He weeps over the city, goes out of Jerusalem halfway up the mountain and weeps over the city for the missed opportunity that was given to the people of the city at his first coming. And he pronounces eight woes over the religious leaders that parallel the eight blessings that he had offered to his followers in Galilee. He prophesied the destruction of the temple 
and his own death, burial, and resurrection. Of course, it was he is the temple of God, and he would be reconstructed in three days. This brings us to the conclusion of Matthew's gospel in chapters 26 through chapters 28. Jesus shared a meal known as Passover with his disciples. He reminded the people of how they were delivered from slavery. Jesus takes the elements of Passover, the bread and the wine, and gives them new meaning, the meaning that we've experienced as we worship together today. His death would redeem people from evil and from sin. And after the meal, Jesus retreats with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, and there he prays, not your will, but my will. Not, <laughs> not my will, but your will be done. You ever prayed that the wrong way, just the way I did? <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Not my will but your will be done. Whatever you're struggling with, may God help you to say, God, what is your will in what I am facing? And it is there that Judas betrays him with a kiss, and Jesus is arrested. He's given a mock trial before the Sanhedrin, and mock trials can only result in a guilty verdict. That's why Jesus said nothing. They brought him before Pilate, and Pilate declared him innocent. But he gives in to the pressures from the Jewish people. Jesus is led away to be crucified. And on the cross, everything that Jesus said was a quote from the Old Testament. It makes it clear that his death was neither a failure nor a tragedy. What happened to him on the cross was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Jesus died as a suffering servant Messiah, spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. After he died, he was placed in the tomb of a very rich man. But Sunday morning, first the woman and then the disciples were surprised to discover that the tomb was empty and Jesus had risen from the dead. A wide variety of people across the city and the region see appearances of Jesus. They are so shocked. And the book ends with Jesus giving what has come to be called the Great Commission. Jesus is now the true king of the world. He sends his disciples out to take the message to the ends of the earth. We are to baptize people and to teach people to do Everything that Jesus taught his disciples to do, including healing, casting out demons, raising the dead, and cleansing incurable diseases. Matthew ends his gospel with the words that we find in chapter 1. Matthew introduced Jesus to us as Emmanuel, God with us. The last words of Jesus are exactly the same. I will be with you to the end of the age. What a powerful message. What a powerful gospel. I hope this message has put fresh desire and insight to you to read the gospel of Matthew for yourself. If you do not have a copy of Matthew's gospel, write to us and we'll send you a digital copy of this amazing eyewitness account to the life of Jesus. So today we ask you the question that Jesus asked so long ago. Who do you say that Jesus is? I pray that God has opened your eyes to see that Jesus was indeed God with us. The good news is that God wants to be with you through having a relationship with Jesus. Jesus came to make it possible for us to have a close relationship with God and to know that we will go to heaven when we die. Ask God to open your eyes to see who Jesus is just like he opened Peter's eyes. Say with me, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me in my place on the cross to pay for my sin and inviting me to live in a close relationship with God. If you just prayed with me to accept Jesus as your Savior or were healed while listening to this message, write to me and we'll share more information with you about what it means 
to follow Jesus. Father, thank you for the amazing testimony of Matthew, a firsthand witness to the life and the words of Jesus. May we live in honor of King Jesus and see his reign of peace and love extended on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.